I had some papers I got from the recruiting station, said that when you turn 17, have your parents sign this, bring it back, and then we can do something. And that's what I did. Ran out the door, ran downtown, went up to the office, the gunny met me again. He says, how'd you do? I said, I've got it. He said, give me it. And that's when he told me I was gonna go in and have that physical that I'll never forget. When we got to San Diego, we all assembled by the parade ground. We had our civvies, civvies, civilian clothes still on. We had our little suitcase or bags. He said, stand at attention if you know what that is. The DI said, I'm supposed to make men out of you and Marines. It's going to be very tough, but I'll work hard at it. The first morning after chow, he fell us out in the company street. We stood at attention. He said, I'm going to march you down to that beach by the boondocks. We got down there and he says, all right, relax. You see those ships over there? They're transports, Navy transports. Yes, sir. When I get through with you, you're going to be assigned to an outfit. And in that outfit, you might just go aboard one of those transports. And if you do what you're told and keep your nose clean, you might just come back. But as I look at you, I doubt it very much. I'm telling you, that really, <laughs> we felt like crying. 17-year-old <laughs> kids, never been away from home before. But that's the way it was in the very beginning of boot camp. Our will became his will for eight weeks. Every morning, weekdays, Monday through Friday, we drilled out in the parade ground at San Diego Marine Corps Base, and I'm telling you, the parade ground was jammed with platoons, and when we marched, it was like this. And we never touched one another. When we left boot camp, we were assigned to a second anti-tank battalion. 37 millimeter guns mounted on a, on a small Dodge pickup truck open. I drove it. And then we had the half track. You've seen a lot of them. Everybody's seen them. Half tracks with the 75 millimeter on the front, 50 caliber that rotated around like that on a track. We got to New Zealand. We trained there for about three months. Then all of a sudden, we said we're going to go to New Mia, New Caledonia, another camp. Not too far from the Solomon Islands. And we were assigned to anybody that wanted us. And Tarawa was on. And they needed replacements. And a lot of them went, but I stayed. Then we went back to the States to form a new division called the 5th Marine Division, the Spearhead Division. Mr. Roosevelt wanted another division, well-trained, well-equipped to hit Iwo Jima. The fourth aided us. They came along with us. The third was in reserve for replacements. I was in the, the 28th Marine Regiment, 2nd Battalion, Dog Company, D Company. Now we were ground troops, prone position on the ground with a rifle. I carried a 72-pound flamethrower, five gallons of fuel. I was in an assault squad. and we trained out behind Camp Pendleton. There's thousands of acres out there. And I noticed that every time we did something, I had to use my flamethrower on a hill. We never heard the word Iwo Jima. No one, it was never mentioned, we never heard of it. I never thought much about it. I can remember one hill that had a sort of an opening, a cave, and I threw fire in it. And when I got through, I heard a lot of rattling, rattling, buzzing. There were a mess of rattlesnakes in there, diamondbacks. They had burned up. They were just rolling, the road. their rattles were rattling, you know. It never dawned on us what we were doing when we, everything had a clip. We invaded, we invaded San Clemente Island off San Clemente. We invaded that island, it has a little volcano on it. And we conquered that. Still, we didn't understand where we were going. I had no choice to become a flamethrower because 
the skipper, the captain, said, Graves, you're our new flamethrower in our company. I said, sir, I'm only, I'm, I, I'm short, and I, I'm, I don't weigh that much. He said, you're going to be a less of a target. Put it on. I said, yes, sir. And he was right. I went through six weeks of combat. I come close to it, come close to being captured, but I never got hit. And you pulled that trigger and it, it ignited, then you shoot the juice up and you got a long bowl of fire. If you held the trigger back on that gun, you have 15 seconds. If you squeeze bursts, you can get five or six bursts. Like that, you're empty. So what you do is you back off, drop it down, wait for it, get on your horn, call up and say, Graves, I'm by so-and-so, bring me a flamethrower, pick up the empty, and they come, they drop it off and take the empty. I have a man on my left, a man on my right, they have to stay with me. If I fall, I can't get up. They have to pick me up. One day we got the word we're gonna pack up. We loaded aboard our usual ship. Every division was assigned to transports. Ours was USS Mazzola. It was an attack transport. It had a five inch gun on the back, one in the bow. We went up and manned the 40 millimeter. We stopped at Saipan and we got off that transport and they transferred us onto LSTs. Now an LST it will handle a company of Marines. Down below our five or six alligator landing craft, wheels, tracks, no nose out in front. You go over the side, you come in over the side. It has to get up on the sand. If it doesn't, you're going in the water and you're gonna to have to walk up there. When we left Saipan on the LSTs, we were about one week to Iwo. And as we got one day out, we finally knew where we were going. They brought clay models up on tables and they gave us orientation about the island. All they could tell us was that they estimate that there were about 22,000 Japanese on that island, eight square miles. They didn't know anything else. And we were told, if you can take a prisoner, take them. We need information. Well, they don't surrender. And so it was very hard getting prisoners until the latter part of the island. They got depressed and some of them surrendered. Oh, I gotta tell you something funny. First time in my life in the Marine Corps. For breakfast at five o'clock in the morning, the board ship and above us, there was fighting going on with, air, with aircraft. And we had steak and eggs. Never had it in the Marine Corps before. Had eggs, but never had a steak. I said to a kid next to me, I said, hey buddy, what's with the steak and eggs? He said, use your head, Graves. What do they do with convicts before they execute them? <laughs> I said, you had to bring that up. Then just, well, that's what's going to happen, he said. This kid was crazy. <laughs> While we're eating, we could, I guess we're about three miles up. We could see everything on that beach. That, that was a mass of clouds. They were blowing that place apart, but very ineffective with personnel. They went down in the caves pulled everything in the caves. We didn't know anything about these caves. Eight square miles, they could go below. It took them of eight, almost eight years to do that, to build those tunnels. Well fortified. I asked the question, a lieutenant. I said, sir, how long do you expect us to be on that item? He said, well, we're gonna be rough on that. At least two weeks. Six weeks, we were on it, six weeks. And then all of a sudden after we ate chow, all hands, board your landing craft. We went down below, I was fine going down, but to get in that little thing, you had to go up over the side end. There was no mouth in front. These the Japanese called these little boats, they call them alligators with wheels because they had tracks and wheels, bogey wheels. And we loaded in there. 
six of them loaded with Marines. Out the front mouth of the big ship, we went out and we rallied around out there, rallied around till the Commodore dropped his flag and then we headed for the beach. Six waves, one, two, three, four, five, six. I was in the third wave. When it was our turn for our wave to go in, we headed for the beach. There were snipers firing at us, nothing heavier than that, but I could hear this. Every now and then off the fantail, I could hear whoosh, whoosh, something like that. And I kind of scooted my head up and looked, and I could see they were blowing us out of the water. I saw at least three hit, direct hit, and blow with Marines in it, blow them just apart. That was it, gone. But it didn't touch us, and we hit the beach. We couldn't get up on the sand. Too many Marines stacked up on the beach. All right, the coxman says, overboard. I got up a hold of that, they picked me up, they threw me right in the water, they jumped over, grabbed me and picked me up out of the water, and I'm spitting water out. I forgot to take off my bowl of a watch that my mother sent me, it was done. And when I hit the beach, I was right down on my face and I unharnessed. I have to really try and remember this because something happened that I, I have to really figure. I unharnessed the flamethrower because mortars were coming and I had to move. So I flipped it off my back. Well, then they begin to move. You have to get off the beach or we're gonna lose our troops. You have to get off the beach. And that was the problem with just a bunch of kids, you know, we scared to death. I can tell you this, I lay on my face and I did something for the first time in my life. I prayed to God. I never prayed to God. I never really did. We never went to church. So I lay there on the beach with my face down there and I saw and I heard what was going on. It was terrible. Bodies floating all over the water. Some of the craft tore all apart. And here's what I said. I said, God, I don't know much about you. I hear things about you. But if you can get me off this island, I'll serve you the rest of my life. He got me off. Six weeks later. There were rifles all over the place. Our buddies were dead. I grabbed an M1 rifle and took that because I didn't know if they were going to come over the top. But see, they let, they let the first two battalions go right across the neck so that we might think, hey, this is not bad at all. Then they stopped us on the beach and the mortars came. Just like that. It was a disaster. I never thought I'd make it off that beach. Kids would be coming back to us, crawling back. Help me, buddy, help me, buddy. You can't do it. We have orders to keep going. You, we have corpsmen for that. I tell them, hang in there, buddy. The corpsmen are coming, they're coming, they'll take care of you. Don't worry, but you're good. You're gonna be all right, and I keep right on going. You cannot stop, you can't help them. We have the corpsmen to do that. There's one thing I heard that scared us all. Now, what we did, we each had a gas mask right to our side, strapped. We took them off because when we hit the ground, it got in our way, we couldn't maneuver. We took them off, every one of us. They launched a mortar and the mortar hit on the top of the ridge ahead of us and it, it, a yellow puff smoke came out. This kid yelled gas. When you hear that word, you want your mask. We didn't have them. It wasn't gas. It was picric acid in the, uh, in the ammunition. It, it was just a false call. He didn't understand. That caused a big panic. Yep. Most casualties in war, like in the Pacific, killed, wounded, by mortars. It was a knee mortar, and you don't fire it from the knee. You jam it down on the ground, and you hold it, and you can boom, boom, just boom. 
and you can throw them in the air. They don't go like they topple. You can see them coming, five or six or seven of them at you. There's no way to run out of the way. You just hope it isn't going to be like you. If one comes or two, you can see them and you can kind of get out of the way. You'll see Marines move. But when they send a whole bunch, there's nothing you can do. That has hurt more men than any other weapon. My battalion, when we hit the beach, was to go up over the top, make a left turn to Mount Suribachi. That's at the neck. Our job was to get on Suribachi, secure it, stop the firepower. Everybody was being hit down there from the top of that mountain, from eight square miles they could launch. If we stopped that mountain, we could cut down half the firepower. And that's what we did. We paid a big price. I, when I got up to the top and turned left, I didn't have anybody with me. I lost my two buddies. I was alone, but I kept going. Then I heard a voice, Graves, Graves. I said, yo, hold up. And it was a buddy of mine, Johnny Arview. We, we were Liberty buddies. He said, I'll help you. So he stayed with me. He had, he had a pouch of grenades. He loved gr throwing grenades. So uh, we, moved, we moved a little ahead and all of a sudden I looked over, there's my skipper, my captain, and he's laying behind a, a flat rock and he's got a cigarette going. We, we love that guy. And he was bleeding like a stuck hog. He was blood all over. It was running out of him. I said, skipper, we gotta get you. You're not gonna do any such thing. You keep going. So they'll get me, they'll get me. Well, they did. They got him on a poncho and took him down the beach. He didn't come back with us, but I saw him 45 years later at a Marine Union in San Antonio. I asked him, I said, Skipper, I said, why did you put that flamethrower on my back? He says, you're here, aren't you? <laughs> when this buddy picked me up and we went together, we, we saw a Japanese run across the front of us, what, a little ways down, and he jumped in a hole. So we moved up closer to the hole, and he said, I'll go throw a couple of grenades in. I said, wait a minute, we gotta see if we can talk them out. They need prisoners. So oh, he says, okay. So I said, dead to Koi, dead to Koi. That means come, come, come out. I said, Kohano Shaki, flamethrower. They don't like that word. Nothing, never came out. So I said, all right, let's advance to it. When I took one step, out he comes. He's got a beautiful uniform on, a beautiful sword on the side, and I spotted that sword, and I said, John, I said, I want that sword, you got it. And he had his hand on his chest, sword here, and he stared at us. The boys are fighting up ahead of us on the left. I see Dr. Coy, Dr. Coy. Boom! Blew himself to smither, but there was nothing left we could find nothing, and he took my sword with him. From the top of the beach, three tiers, Mount Suribachi, and our job was to take that mountain, my battalion. We made a left turn from the top of the beach to the base of Mount Suribachi, it was 545 feet. We got there on the third day.